So the reason for the call is that um, I was at a letter exchange meeting last week and Robbie Schneider said to me, oh, have you listened to Charlotte and Nina's podcast? And I said, no, I've not even heard about it. <laughs> and, and then I looked online and listened to, I think, about three episodes of the podcast. And um, I spoke to John and I said, we ought to review this in the forum. So that's the reason for the call. But I wanted to find out before we go ahead and do that, I wanted to find out from you guys how it all came about, um, what your program is, um, you know, is it going to last for a while, uh, so that we can brief someone who can then um, review you. So that's, that's <laughs> really really cool. <laughs> well, I'll let you start, Charlotte, I think. Um, so I met Nina years ago, but it's only in the last few years since I've, I don't know, maybe eight, nine years since I've been teaching at City and Gills. Uh, I do four days every two years as a visiting lecturer. And we just really got on well. We clicked and we have a lot in common. We have a lot of similarities in our practice and huge differences as well. Mm -hmm. And we started talking about running some carving workshops together because we're both Norfolk based. And we never really did anything about it for ages until a few years ago, we jumped in at the deep end and we ran a three day residential carving course in an off-grid glamping site in the village that I live in. <laughs> and it was exhausting and exhilarating and absolutely fantastic. And um, so we ran a second one last year and we just got on so well and we laughed so much, but we learned so much. And I just said, why don't we do a podcast? And again, we did nothing about it, did we? We sort of let things slide. I think I'm always the one that's I'm definitely good at driving things. <laughs> you are the engine, Charlotte. You're definitely And I just the said, engine. come on, let's do it. And so then we went out and we spent a few pounds on some microphones. And I think when you've spent money, you're, you're committed. Otherwise, your money's wasted. At least that's always my mm -hmm. thought. And so that's what sort of that's where we started, really. And Nina, I think you, we spend. Sorry. Sorry. Go on. You, you teach at Sitting Girls. Is that right? So I'm the senior stone carving tutor, so I run the stone okay. carving element. And mm -hmm. Tom Young is the dedicated lettering tutor mm -hmm. who runs the visiting tutor program there, along yeah. with Mark Frith, who does the wood. So um, I'm a carver. I'm not a letter cutter at all. Um, and like Charlotte says, you know, our differences make us very strong as a kind of, you know, a, a teaching bubble, if you like. We kind of can cover all the bases, mm -hmm. really. And I was interested in, in one of the podcasts, you talk about having some aphasia where you have, have trouble with symmetry. Is that, is that right? I do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it took me years to realize I did. And it wasn't until I started doing formal portraiture courses where we were taught very clearly. And actually, it was somebody who started using language in a particular way. And instead of assimilating what she thought she's very good at Kim Amos is one of our modeling tutors or the modeling tutor at the college. And she taught me the real importance of descriptive language when trying to pass on um, information to someone who possibly hasn't done that kind of thing before. And while attending one of her courses as a kind of freebie mates rates kind of at the back of the class while she taught these students, I listened to her describe Oh, lost Nina's you, out. And lost you there, Nina. Can you say that again, please? Have you? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, it, it language like fast curves, slow turns, um, in front of, behind of, using the words like landscape, journey, and I realised that I'd struggle for years to tell my brain how to identify issues, and I have issues seeing fast turns slow turns you know junctions of directional change if I have to mirror them I cannot mirror them I can't turn them up you know in front and I don't like, like a podcast you know had told me to use mirrors uh, I, 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 and I always think it's smoke and mirrors you know a bit like Paul Daniels it's a it is a magic thing that we do we is all kind of dancing with illusion isn't it and 
Um, it changed my absolute um, knowledge of my own limitations and it gave me tools to break those limitations and make life easier and faster. But it also taught me the importance of listening to descriptive language and how you can break through barriers of not physical understanding of form if you say the right words in the right order. And it, it was a combination of the two. So it was identifying that I had this issue and that I wasn't just not very good at something. It was having a tool to help me overcome that. And on top of that, knowing how to describe my, uh, you know, for a better word, my sort of learning difference in that sense, but also understanding that my descriptive words and my own teaching was really important for other people to break through their own to identify their own um, struggles, I think. That's a long-winded way of saying yes. Yeah, I thought that was <laughs> an interesting conversation because Charlotte, I mean, the sort of symmetrical axis is such a, in a sense, yeah. such an important thing in the letter carving world. Yeah. So it, it was, it, I think it showed, it led to areas of complementarity and difference, I think, in the approach that you both take to, to stone, I guess. Mm. I, I love that. Uh, for me, that's it's, it's a constant fascination to me is our, our understanding of a material that we both have a knowledge of and a sort of completely different way of working and using it in our uh, in our work. So I would be much more familiar with much harder stones than Nina because letter cutting generally the stuff you know, that you have to carve to earn a living is for monumental purposes. So we like the very tight grain, hard materials where for carving, you use a more soft, in general, a more softer grained material. And then, you know, because of that, it's given us completely different experiences. So I had never used a fire sharp chisel until I started uh, working alongside Nina. You know, we just as a letter carver, all of my chisels have always been tungsten. And I didn't realize that there was a place for those chisels in the mod, which sounds ridiculous now, I know you. <laughs> but I just thought they were something from the dark ages that, you know, people didn't really bother with anymore in our practice. So, you know, for me, it's this constant uh, eye-opening revelation. And, you know, I just love learning uh, off each other. Mm. And, I think it's uh, quite interesting because my my interest in tools is uh, so let's say you cutting out again there Nina I don't normally have a problem with Nina's Wi-Fi yeah it seems to have frozen in a rather embarrassing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well while, while we're waiting for Nina to to reconnect Nina oh, you'll sorry. keep um, that yeah, I'm wondering if you open your, it seems like an internet connection. If you open your door, sometimes that makes a difference if you're not getting a good signal. Uh, anyway. <laughs> I never tried that. <laughs> um, so actually this conversation is an it's interesting... Funny, is, that, is that button? Yeah. So... Um, do we, uh, should we go back to what Nina, Nina was saying there? Yeah. Oh, just that we both love tools and mm. that um, I love the fact that um, the limitation of in the expensive nature of tire shop, but we both love, um, I wouldn't say gadgets, they are usable tools, they're not things to use and throw away, but Charlotte's uh, like opened my eyes to things like the magnetic tool strip was the first thing that she opened my eyes to, which, <laughs> which I've kind of passed on, but um you know, the kitchen knife magnetic strip. But I think um, we both love the idea of tools making life easier in one way. Mm. And uh, the yeah. open-minded nature around it. Yeah, I can see that. But I was also led to um, other questions about the way the collaboration collaboration has been influential. Um, I spend quite a bit of time in Bruges with the Budens family, who I'm very... Oh, okay. With. And one of the interesting things I find about them is that they sit midway between what you might call the European mm -hmm. lettering tradition, Sepp Jacob and that kind of scene, and Jean-Claude Lombreau being very influential for them, but also, um, you know, the, the English letter carving scene. And if I characterise it, the English letter carving scene 
it went, you know, a lot of attention on letter forms, but almost treating the stone as a piece of paper, you know, particularly slate. Whereas the European tradition tends to be more focused on a kind of sculptural object. And I wondered whether that, you know, tendency, but I suppose it's a question only for Charlotte, whether you've been, through the collaboration with Nina, been a, sort of going more towards the sculptural object kind of approach than might, you know, be the normal case for traditional English. I think, uh, although I'm trained in the English tradition, I uh, spent a number of years working for a stone carving sculptor in Ireland. And what that gave me was a really different understanding of stone as a material that was malleable in a way that you didn't get through the English letter carving tradition. So for many years, I've treated stone in a more sculptural, well, I think I have, as a more sculptural form and not really um, been limited to it as using as a piece of paper. And I absolutely fundamentally understand what you're saying there. But yes, working with Nina has deepened that knowledge of material um, to uh, give me a more a different understanding and introduced me to material softer materials that I might not have looked at for stone carving before so I you know I always really liked a very textural rounded piece um, I used to when I was a student I did um, I worked for Ralph Beyer um, on a you know I used to do a day every now and again for him and go to his house and I think Ralph had a more sculptural approach to treating stone in the way he would soften the edges. And, you know, it, 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 it wasn't always just a bit of stone stuck on a wall with some lettering on it. It was always about context and, you know, how, how your stone worked within the environment. And I, you know, I do think sometimes that because we are letter carvers. We think, oh, a bit of stone with some letter carving on it and stuck on a wall, that's what we do. But it isn't always the right answer. We have to think beyond that and mm -hmm. ask ourselves, is that the right approach to this piece of work just because that's what we do? I mm -hmm. think sometimes the answer is definitely no. I think the blending of traditions is a really, it feels to me fruitful for both areas because if, I, if I'm critical of quotes, the European tradition, it's that the letter form sometimes isn't that great. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, if you can combine the two, which I do think happens in the, the Bowden's work, you do see a really interesting combination of the two approaches. But I, I guess, Nina, the same question could be asked for you. In what ways do you think, you know, working closely with Charlotte might have influenced your own work? We can't hear you now, Nina. <laughs> You're mute. <laughs> No, we can't hear you. Still mute. Still on mute. I know my free my go. screen. I'm sorry. I'm trying to find a better internet so, so, solution. Sorry, this doesn't happen usually. Um, I think I would nail it down to a small anecdote where we were teaching, and I carved um, a small relief. Um, in one of the sessions, I, I carved a, a little example for one of the students and then Charlotte came up to me and she'd carved a very similar thing. And I had attacked it in such a way that it was quite three dimensional and she'd done a, a very similar thing. And it was, um, you know, in the letter cutting tradition. And it was interesting because we'd both, you know, I hadn't even thought about it doing the Charlotte way and she hadn't thought about it doing it my way. So my instinct is to remove material in a three dimensional I'm very I was always very influenced by as a um as a picture plane and Charlotte's definitely taught me the illustrative nature of line rather than relying such and uh, she's a very she's a brilliant designer and I would say, you know, had she not been a letter cutter, she'd probably be a very successful textile designer or, you know, painter. I think she's got an incredible use of colour, line, design and repetitive pattern as well, which I've always envied. Um, whereas I was, it wouldn't matter what I'd have done for a living, I'd have always ended up taking something, a big hammer and an axe or something to, to make it into three dimensions. I definitely think of something in 360 degrees, whereas Charlotte 
shows 360 degrees, but possibly on a one dimensional plane, I think. Mm. I just as you were saying, I mean, I, it, just, it just brings to mind some of my favorite carvings, which are the on the north wall of Chichester Cathedral, where Romanesque um, flat carvings with the, the you know the the texture of the fabrics in uh, are just yeah. absolutely absolutely fantastic. Really, combination of line and three dimensionality, although they're very they're very flat carvings as well. And I think that's the first thing that a lot of students learn. They, and a lot of students will come to me with the knowledge of Romanesque carving because it's accessible. It's easy to replicate if you're very observant of nuance, yeah. you know, and you don't allow a contemporary eye to take over what you think an eye or a face should look like. And um, actually, they're more sophisticated than they appear when you dissect them. And they are based in anatomy. They are based in the real. And actually, all they what they were doing was was painting in shade and color. You know, you know, and you know, pattern. And I think it's fascinating because I'd say ninety percent of the people I teach will will start and come to me with a knowledge of Romanesque mm -hmm. carving, which I think is really interesting because they think, oh, I could do that. Yeah. I could what? achieve that. That's something I could yeah. achieve. What? But actually, when you start looking at it in depth, it's incredibly hard to replicate. Mm, I'm sure. What I would add uh, about um, the earlier question about doing the podcast is that we both love to teach. And we like mm. to, you know, one of the things we hope to do with the podcast is inspire people to have a go, to, you know, take some of the barriers down to stone carving and make it accessible in a way people don't realize it can be and that it does you know it doesn't really matter what stage you're on in having a go sitting there thinking about it you're never going to get any better there's only one way that you're going to improve and that's by doing it and so mm -hmm. it's it's just about talking about it messing about having a laugh and I think it, it, it's really interesting. Both Charlotte and I have mentored a lot of young people, apprentices. Um, I've mentored a lot of male apprentices from building sites, et cetera, over my years. And there is this thirst to make enrichment carvings, you know, ornamental pieces, even if their main income is to do architectural restoration. There is real thirst to do something slightly more ornate, and it's not always encouraged in some social, in some kind of like trade circles, if you like. You know, that's that's over there. That's not for you. That's not for you. And in the same way, it, the idea that you have to be very strong or you have to, you know, have a huge technical knowledge to act. You can't do it. Can't do it. And I think there are two things that Charlotte and I truly believe, and that is that carving, like she says, is absolutely accessible to everybody. But also for those stone things, you know, adding to your skill set is also possible and it doesn't have to cost a huge amount of money. You just need some really good direction to take you to the next place. It's all self-directed. And of course, stone carving is not something you can you can fudge. It, you are as good as the product you produce. No matter you throw at it will give you a career in stone carving unless you can do it. And actually, for some people, that's very hard to accept. And for other people, you know, they appreciate the learning and the slow kind of drip by drip practice of it to get better. And I think what we both believe is that it doesn't matter where you are on the rainbow of stone carving skills, whether you're somebody who does it you know to relax or if you're somebody who does it for a living but wants to get a different experience we we think we that's what we want to do we want to enable those people on any part of that journey because really amazing people have given their time and their excellence and their skill set to us you know I'll tell you a story so when I decided I did after the different different you know in my early 20s that I wanted to cut stone I wrote to 50 different persons and company two people wrote back and one of them was Charlotte's stepfather oh. um 
basically go to City and Gills and that Charlotte was at City and Gills at the time. And it always stuck with me that he encouraged me so beautifully with a handwritten letter. David was lovely. And then the person who enabled me was a stonemason in Wandsworth who basically said, you can come and work for me for free. I'll give you some skills and, you know, you can have a go. And so I sacrificed a day's money and I went and worked for him for free for one day a week. And without those two people and hundreds of other people in the meantime, incredible employers, accepting employers, people who took a risk on having a woman in the workshop. And let's, let's say that out loud. That was the case. Um, I wouldn't be doing this. And I think Charlotte and I want to make that kind of advice and support and mentorship available to people who may not be able to find those people in other, any other um, a chance for the, so you had the connection through your stepfather before you met officially, as it were, sitting girls. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. we. Well, well, I never met he... Charlotte until I... no. Louise introduced she us, didn't she? Video many years ago, and yeah. I, I just kind of turned up and said, "Hello, I'm trying to do this." And she swept me off my feet. She was like, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. And you could do this and you could do this. And I never forgot it. I never forgot that. Charlotte, do you have similar... She's um, a whirlwind. It's... Mentors that you... <laughs> I've been so lucky. I've had the most amazing people teach me. And like Nina, um, uh, somebody who's experienced generosity from, you know, most of my teachers, um, um, you know, we did three years at the City and Guilds under Brenda Berman and Annette Sterling and still in touch with, you know, Annette if, and Brenda, if I need help, they're there. And I feel, you know, those ties of encouragement and mentorship has ne have never really left. Uh, about six or seven years ago, Brenda wrote to me out of the blue and said, oh, um, I think you need to apply to the Winston Churchill Fellowship Trust, um, you know, now's the time for you to do it. And so she, I'm, I'm uh, not very good at writing. <laughs> and so I had help from her and help from somebody else to put my application together. And I was awarded a traveling fellowship. Uh, so, you know, so all through my career, the people who've helped me, they've never really stepped back. And I just find that so amazing that, you know, I started at City and Guilds when I was 19 and I'm 53 now. And so for all of those years, you know, I've always received help and encouragement and advice from, you know, not, you know, not just from my old tutors, but from the whole community of lettering, which is actually astonishing and amazing when I look at it like that. And mm -hmm. I think that's how skills survive is through the generosity of people passing them on I want to be part of that I want to pass on the understanding of what that generosity is about so that the people who you know we help feel that sense of responsibility to do it when their time is right as well mm -hmm. and what did what did you do with your church or fellowship Oh, I had a wonderful time. I loved it. I mean, mm -hmm. I floated on about Clyde nine for six weeks. <laughs> so that was mostly what I did. And I, um, I'm not academic. I'm, I, I'm not an academic person, uh, but I'm very instinctive and intuitive. And so I'd never been to Rome and I'd never been to uh, Italy. Or, so I went to, first of all, to Greece and then to Rome and what I really wanted to do was look at the Christian carvings, the early Christian free carvings that Ralph Beyer had been influenced by. And so I started off in uh, Greece because of the Greek, alpha, you know, comes before the Roman alphabet and look at those early influences. And then I went on to Italy uh, after that. And it was it was amazing, actually. And, you know, I'm not very well read. I like looking at pictures. I mean, I always wonder who reads those lettering books because I very rarely do. I, you know, I look at the pictures and I see all the big blocks of text and I wonder who really reads that because it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went, you know, visually informed, but not academically informed, not historically very informed. And I was so struck, you know, I've been learning all about Trajan letters my whole life and was you know really excited to go and see all of Trajan column and the Roman carved capitals and 
I started off in Greece and all the lettering was completely different. It had a completely different voice. And then I moved to Italy. And then all of a sudden, it just shouted at me, this Trajan lettering. And I hated it. You know, it made me feel ill. I just saw power, masculinity, authority. Mm. And I just thought, isn't that interesting? I've never even thought of it like that. And now it's completely changed my view of what I look for from lettering. You know, it's made me think more about the voice of the letters, how, you know, how we use, you know, how we use Roman forms without even thinking about, you know, their origins and, you know, what they were designed for. Because, and, and so coming from Greece and looking at the ancient Greek lettering, it's got such a different voice. It's so much quieter. It isn't authoritarian in the same way. Well, these, you know, this is what I feel. It's not, it's not academically researched. And it just completely inspired me to, you know, make people feel they don't have to learn the Trajan letters if they want to have a go at lettering. There are other ways of learning letters. There's other letters to look at, other forms, you know, it doesn't have to be this great high, high way of learning. Mm. I had exactly the same experience in Rome. Oh, did you? I, I looked at the, all around the capital and at those sorts of places. And I looked at it, I thought, oh my goodness me, this is a fascist state here. This yes. is uh, this is yeah. really this is imperialism. Yeah, um, I have exactly the same, and I I think that exact. Well, I echo the experience. Um, can I ask you about the podcast itself? Yes. And so, how did uh, I think you've you've already you've said something about how you got going? But how do you plan it, and how do you record it? And what's the sort of mechanics of it all? Well, it took an awful lot of research to understand how to get it done um once you know um but I always think you know a little bit of investment is a great way to spur you on because you do not want to waste your money so we've bought a couple of mics and headsets and then uh we had to learn how to do it so I uh we spent quite a lot of time um going through online tutorials um so and um I'll be quick because we've got 10 minutes left on the zoom that's right call. yeah I've seen that come up yes yeah. yeah. <laughs> um so I learn how to do it online and so what we do is we we have a free zoom account which limits us to 40 minutes which is a great way of keeping it fairly concise and uh, we record on zoom and then i edit the software in a free editing program called audacity and then upload it so we do have a a fairly loose uh lesson plan when we talk about it and we've just recorded two brilliant uh people that we've done our next two podcasts with uh we've interviewed with uh we try and put them out every month on the 10th and you know so we, we've got we've got you know we've got like a plan of stuff that we want to talk about that we reassess and and, and keep ahead of ourselves and uh we were thinking a, of, a, of a very strict kind of beginning to end kind of linear yeah, structure to the whole thing but actually it became a little bit more organic when we talked about what we were interested in the time you know things books etc and um actually what would be quite useful and I think you know we have a little bit in the podcast which is the fitting room which is basically a, a tiny piece of practical information that might you know be useful for some people and the results have been really lovely we had a lovely um email from a woman in america who say um she makes um ceramic urns for funeral um you know ashes and she works on her own in a studio etc and she just said she came upon us and it was like having a couple of friends over for a cup of tea and just having a chat and i think we were so struck by that we kind of kept to that ethos that we have a vague structure backbone to the to the um to the podcast and we allow ourselves a certain amount of meandering there is quite a lot of meandering that we cut out i have to say charlotte's brilliant at editing <laughs> some rubbish out but we we had a very strict you know 20 20 to 26 minutes long you know 30 minutes long tops when we do an interview we both decided we, we will obviously talk less and give as much time over to the person who we're interviewing and we will go over the 30 minutes we both decided if that person you know, who's so generously given us their time, they'll go over that. And um, Charlotte's got really good at editing, you know, and, and making um, making it sound easy, actually, when actually it's not, the editing process is not easy, but she's really got on top of that. So 
So, uh, I mean, do you have a sort of rehearsal before you record, or are you you just agree we're going to talk about this, and then you're straight on in, and then that, that's straight it. I think we both have notes. I mean, I do, I don't know if she does, but I definitely have a little page of notes and make and kind of circle around. Um, themes and especially if there's a particular exhibition or some information that you're quite keen to get out um, I think we have to be careful you know obviously we record them a month behind so if you're talking about topical things there is that issue you have to make sure that that's relevant in a month's time but um, no it's quite organic and I think we both like that because um, otherwise it would feel too rehearsed and too kind of staged I think. I hope uh, it's fun and interesting so that people yeah. enjoy listening to it it makes them have a little smile but then they can learn something as well mm. that's what and, I and hope in, for. I mean and then the editing process I mean do you how granular do you get with editing can you take out individual words or you know yeah. just no no yeah. no it's quite it's just like it's interesting it's you know because I'm very uh I use digital technology a lot in my work I'm very familiar with Photoshop and Adobe and what I found is although that's a visual thing and I'm working with audio there's a lot of transferable skill in how you uh, move and uh change things so you get a bit you get a like a an audio line across your screen and because I'm so visual, it actually, you know, you can quickly tune into it as a visual thing as well as a as an audio thing. So, you know, there's always going to be a limited amount to what I'm going to be able you, to do. You you said you can, I, you know, if even if the sound was off, Charlotte knows if I'm talking or she's talking just from the picture, you know, registration on the audio line. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know immediately if it's... Yeah. And also, I can see the ums and the ahs quite quickly a lot of the time as well now. <laughs> Okay. All right. Yeah. And so you, you you do it on Zoom like this, so you can see each other. And yeah, we record uh, on Zoom, and yeah, then mm -hmm. you get an audio file from Zoom, and then I pull mm -hmm. it into Audacity, and edit it from there. And then um, you need a hosting platform, uh, so you have to pay a small fee to host your podcast. And so we have a hosting uh, platform. And again, all all of that is a learning curve. You have to go through a whole process of understanding what to do to get it out there and to sync it in with all the different platforms that you can listen to. So Google, Apple, you know, you, know, you have to register with the different platforms, some of them independently. So, you know, it's quite, you know, getting it up and running was quite a lot of hard work and a lot of learning. But once we're done, we're, we're sort of over that now. So now we just need to invest the time it takes to do it um, you know, most of the learning for that side of it has, has been done now. And how are you building an audience? Um, do you have any means of publicising what you're doing? Uh, we haven't done it too. I mean, I'm really surprised, actually, because the only places we've put it out are on Instagram and Facebook. But um, I mean, and our, you know, we're very niche, uh, very niche in terms of our subject matter. But when I look at our numbers and, you know, the hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, you know, considering we've done so little marketing, we're sort of we're in the, you know, 50 percent of listened to podcasts. Um, you know, it's not masses of numbers, but some, you know, lots of podcasts hardly have anybody listening to them. And, you know, each time, you know, we've done four so far and each podcast we've put out, our numbers have grown a little bit. Um, so I'm really no, no, pleasantly we've, surprised. We've got a few people, a couple of people have been very generous with publicising it. The Lettering Arts Trust um, yes. yeah. have been brilliant at putting it onto their social media. So we've got a few people who um, regularly forward it on. And because we've got a network of makers, a lot of, a lot of makers are then forwarding it on, yeah. which is very... Um, but we're not marketing gurus that by nature are we? we're not no we're carvers we're really and makers <laughs> um, and do you get a sense of who's listening i mean I think you mentioned makers i mean outside the lettering world are we getting just i mean we just get a few emails yeah. from people saying how much they've enjoyed it so mm. i just couldn't to say i think we've got it, two I minutes think left sorry okay if you, if you're working on your own in the studio it feels like a lot of people you know, doing the washing up or making lunch or Sunday lunch, you know, people said, oh, we listened to you on a Sunday morning or while I was decorating. And 
but I'm a lone maker and I don't have that da daily dialogue with anybody like you. And it's just, mm. and that's to we're aiming. And I don't think there's much out there. And, you know, when we no. had a look, we couldn't find anything uh, with a similar sort of subject matter as well right. which was why we with our and also there's very few people like us with much experience as charlotte for instance and you know they're they're quite rare so um i think we we are um very unique in that sense that we've come together with such our vast background differences our clear connection and our similarities and our thirst for new stuff learning teaching we're very unique in that sense, and I think uh, we feel we do feel a, a, a little pocket. Okay. Certainly, yeah. But we'll try and we'll try and give you a little puff in the journal. Ah, oh, brilliant! Thank, Thank you. you very um, much. Yeah. I, I've got one or two people in mind who I invite to come and review you, but that's really <laughs> helpful background for me, and I'm really nice oh. actually, to be honest, just to meet meet the both of you and have a yeah a same vice versa although we oh, that's lovely and business. to you and to yeah. you yeah <laughs> well thanks for setting up the, the call and and as i say we'll be in touch unfortunately that we only publish the journal twice a year so it won't yeah. be no, I know that. Issue, yeah. but, um, what i'll do yeah. is i'll send you a link and mm -hmm. we'll put this up on our, our youtube channel and that uh, anybody can go and listen to it great i'll send you a link right. to that as well thank you both. i might All attempt right. to edit the ums and ahs out <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for and the freezing, us. the freezing screens. Take care of yourself. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.